From the Tacoma Dome in beautiful Washington State, the Quiet Hour and Lifestyle Medicine Institute are proud to present Dr. Hans Deal in New Beginnings. I want to welcome you tonight to a presentation on reversing heart disease. One of the very hottest topics today discussed in medical meetings around the country, around the world, reversing heart disease. How can we extend our lifespan? Is there some magic to it? Are there some medications? Is a transcendental medication? What are the secrets? Let me just share with you that I believe that none of these things really work. Because when it comes to extending your lifespan or reaching the full potential of a lifespan, if you want to live with all your heart and die younger as late as possible, there are no real secrets, but there's a sensible lifestyle that we need to take a closer look at. We want to do that tonight. I want to take you tonight to a fascinating study that was published in 1973, a study that was so important that the author of the study was suggested for the consideration of the Nobel Prize. It is known as the Alameda Health Study. Let's take a look at this famous study that enrolled 7,000 people in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Dr. Breslow wondered whether certain health habits might have an influence in determining the lifespan of people. He wrote a large grant to study 7,000 people for nine years. And what he did, he interviewed with his research team the 7,000 enrollees, and he detailed out a profile of their lifestyle. And his idea was that maybe certain lifestyle factors may have something to do in extending life or shortening life. And here's what he found. This is a long study. I'm just spending three minutes on it. But this man has given his life to this study. The Alameda Health study, a study that has been carried on for nine years plus another six years that has cost millions of dollars. And here's what he found. You wouldn't believe it. He found that people who had regular meals, three meals a day, lived longer than people who irregularly ate. Now, isn't that kind of astounding? He also found that people who had breakfast every morning lived longer than people who would not have breakfast in the morning. Now, what we do as scientists, we adjust all the other attributes or characteristics of a population of a person so that only one aspect stands out. In this case, breakfast. And when you adjust for all the other factors that people exhibit, breakfast stood out as being associated with affecting mortality, longevity. And then they found out that regular exercise had something to do with lifespan. They found that those people who exercised had only half the death rate of those people that did not exercise. And then they found that people who slept seven to eight hours had a better life expectancy than those 
who slept less than seven hours or more than eight. And that kind of sounds almost pulled out of the blue air, doesn't it? But they suggested that people that probably spent more than eight hours or nine hours in bed, they probably suffer more frequently from depression. They have a more difficult time getting out of bed. And then they found that smoking was associated with cutting short life. I think you would have expected that. Moderate weight versus overweight was giving you an advantage to living longer. And they found that alcohol curtailed your lifespan, especially when it was used in amounts like four and more drinks per day. And you say, well, this is all good common sense. I don't know why we have to spend millions of dollars. After all, Grandma knew that. Yes, Grandma knew a lot of things. But this is the first mathematical verification that some of these folklore and folk wisdom ideas actually have a scientific basis. But Dr. Breslow found out some other things. Let's just take a look at this. He found that those people who practiced less than four of these very simple health habits had considerably more deaths in their group than people that practiced four or five or six or seven. From this slide here, you can see that there's a linear relationship. The more good health habits practiced, the less deaths in this group. Which means then that these good health habits are additive in terms of lifespan. As they were doing more sophisticated analyses, they found some other interesting aspects. And that is, they found that those who practiced all seven health habits have the health status of those 30 years younger who observed none. Think of it. If you are 60 years of age and you don't practice any of these health habits, You're just that. You're six years of age. But if you are six years of age and you practice all seven health habits and you've done this for some time, you actually have the health status of a 30-year-old person that doesn't practice these health habits. So that means that as you get older, you can actually get younger depending on the kind of lifestyle that you choose to live. A 45-year-old American man in this large study was shown to live 11.5 years longer practicing six or seven health habits when compared to a man 45 years of age that would only practice less than four health habits. Just think about it. The difference of three health habits translates into an additional 11.5 years. With all the wonders of technological medicine in the last 100 years, we had at best have achieved about a four to five year lifespan for adults, and that is if we give all the credit to medical science. But by making some simple changes in our health lifestyle, we have the prospect of enlarging or curtailing our lifespan by 11.5 years. Think of how powerful grandma's wisdom was then and is today scientifically established. And then we come to another large study, a study that has taken up $10 million. This study is known as the Adventist Health Study carried out at Loma Linda University, one of the largest medical schools in North America. The Loma Linda University Medical School and the School of Public Health studied Seventh-day Adventists. 
They wanted to know, do Adventists that practice a rather conservative lifestyle, Adventists who do not smoke, do not use alcohol, and some of them that are vegetarians and some of them are not, do Adventists that live a different lifestyle perhaps than most Americans in terms of health habits, do they have better health and do they live longer? They were rather astounded to find that Adventists have only 20% the amount of lung cancer that you would expect in a California group of people that are non-Adventists. So instead of having 100% that you find in a sample of non-Adventists, the Adventists are only 20% or one-fifth the strongest evidence that smoking and lung cancer are related because Adventists do not smoke. And those that become lung cancer victims are probably those Adventists who joined the church later in life after they had been smokers for many years. Smoking and lung cancer. They also found that the Adventists have virtually no cancer of the mouth, throat, and voice box and their bladder cancer rates are only one-third of what you would expect. At the same time, Adventists have very, very low rates of emphysema and bronchitis or because Adventists do not smoke. That makes sense, doesn't it? So this is a very powerful indication that our lifestyle, our smoking behavior has an effect on certain diseases. And since Adventists do not use alcohol, they wondered if alcohol-related diseases would be fewer, and indeed that is the case. For instance, cancer of the food pipe of the esophagus is only one-third of what you would have expected. Liver cirrhosis is virtually non-existent in Seventh-day Adventists, and Adventists only have about 54% of the single vehicle traffic accidents. Does that mean that Adventists are better drivers? Does that mean that God watches better and more carefully over Adventists? I'm not so sure, but you see, Adventists do not drive and drink. They do not drink, period, and so you would expect fewer traffic accidents related to alcohol abuse. And then some other things emerged which have been tantalizing to the medical establishment and the research community. They found that Adventists have only 72% of the breast cancer rates digestive tract cancer, leukemia, uterine cancer. Cancers in general are only two-thirds the rate of what you would expect in an Adventist. And the big question is, why are Adventists somehow protected from these cancers? And then they found out that Adventists have only 55% of the heart disease rate. They only have 53% of the strokes. Diabetes is at half the point of what you would expect, and peptic ulcers are much less too, and of course suicides are much lower. And again, the question is why? Why do Adventists have less heart disease? And if it is only half the amount, maybe we can learn something from the Adventists because the chances are that we could shave off 50% of all the heart disease deaths. Maybe we could shave off 35% of all the cancer deaths. What do the Adventists have in common that may be protective from these so-called killer diseases? And then they found out that Adventist men live six years longer. And of course, you probably have guessed it by now. The Adventists, by and large, practice not only abstinence from smoking and tobacco, which is obviously protective, but when it comes to certain cancers and heart disease, Adventists have a different dietary pattern. About 50% of the Adventists are meat-eating Adventists, but if they eat meat, it's usually fewer steaks, less meat, and it is probably what you would call so-called clean meats. The other 50% are lacto-ovo-vegetarians. They don't eat meat, but they take some cheeses, 
some dairy products and some eggs. And then there's a very small group of Seventh-day Adventists that have embraced the concept of total vegetarianism. No meat, no dairy products. If they use them, it's usually a little bit of skim milk and virtually no eggs. And the question was asked by the National Cancer Institute, would there possibly be a difference among the Adventists who are already somehow protected to some extent from certain diseases, would there be a difference within those three groups? Let's take a look. Here's what they found. They found that the meat-eating Adventists had 350 to 400% more heart disease than the total vegetarians, and the lactose vegetarians are somewhere in the middle. What a powerful demonstration that diet can make a big difference in disease outcome. I'd like to give you a very quick report tonight on the Pritikin Longevity Center. I had the good fortune of spending several years there in directing the education and research activities there. It's a program that usually attracts people that are desperate. People that have heart disease, people that have diabetes, people that have high blood pressure, people that have seen the best doctors in the world, but somehow the disease progress doesn't stop. The disease continues. The process progresses. More medication, more surgery, but they wonder if there might be a better way to turn off the problem at the basis, at the root, at the cause. And so they come from different parts of the world to a four-week program where they spend seven, eight, nine thousand dollars to learn how to eat. These are people that are millionaires, many of them, and you can see them right here after they had their medical workup done. They're very carefully evaluated by a very competent staff. Then they go into a 40 to 50 hour education program. And they're being trained very carefully to understand the relationship between how you eat, how you exercise, and the diseases that we have in North America. And how you can not only prevent but reverse these diseases and hopefully not have to take as much medication. Here you see tycoons learning how to prepare food dishes. We have had many times people that said, look, I brought my chef here. I'm not doing any cooking. I have my chef here. I brought him with me. Uh, let him learn how to do it. Oh, no. You need to see how to prepare food. You need to do it yourself so that you become more intimately involved with what you eat. You want to be more knowledgeable. And of course, these people, they bicycle, they exercise, uh, they walk. They usually walk on the average six miles per day. And when they leave, they usually maintain their one hour day walking program, which we recommend to you. The results, absolutely stunning. 65% of angina patients of all medication for the angina because they no longer feel the angina pain. Physicians that would come in as patients on 50 to 100 nitroglycerin tablets a day, after four weeks, they walk six, seven, eight, nine miles. They may take one or two nitroglycerin tablets. 85% of people on medication for high blood pressure problems within four weeks 85% no longer need medication to control their blood pressure because the diet, the simple diet, and the well-constructed and structured exercise program has a powerful remedial effect on hypertension. 50% of type 2 diabetics on insulin coming into the program Within four weeks, they're no longer on any insulin because their diabetes is reversed. Published now in over 20, 30 scientific articles.
a splendid opportunity for not only symptom treatment, but to getting to the cause of the problem, namely the lethal American diet coupled with smoking, coupled with a slothful lifestyle, the couch potato. Of course, we also have seen some rather interesting changes in the American lifestyle overall without going to some of these programs such as the Predican program or the Weimar New Star program and other programs where people actually learn how to live, how to eat and how to drink, how to stop smoking and how to get into an exercise program. Remember what I said the very first night? The good life is killing us. You don't want the good life. You want the best life, and the best life is a simplified life, isn't it? It means that you have a focus. You have a center. You know who you are. You know where you come from, and you know where you're going, and you know that good food is part of living the good life, which gives you the best life. Tasty, inexpensive available to all of us, coming to us from the hand of the Creator Himself. Not foods in crinkly bags, not foods that are manufactured where engineers, food engineers, try to come up with a new taste sensation which has very little to do with food but it's just a chemical concoction. No, real food food, divine origin. We have seen in the last 20 years some dramatic changes in the American lifestyle. For instance, we know that smoking has decreased by 20, 30 percent by now. Uh, milk and cream consumption has gone down by 25 percent in the last 25, 30 years. Butter is down by 30 percent and eggs are eaten very, very fewer now than 20 years ago. And with these changes, we have experienced a significant change in the average national blood cholesterol level. Cholesterol levels have come down, and it's estimated that this drop in cholesterol alone probably saved 20% of the population from heart disease. Has heart disease really come down? Dr. Jeremiah Stamler, a very reputable cardiologist in Chicago, made a scientific presentation. He said, we could save 83% of all the heart attacks and heart disease victims if we could just help people to get their cholesterol below 182 if you could help them to get their blood pressure below 130 points, and if we help them to stop smoking. 83% of all the heart disease is basically self-induced because we somehow overlook the great opportunity in bringing these major risk factors into more ideal ranges. Did heart disease come down? with a change in the American diet in the last 20, 25 years. Here are the facts. You see that heart disease climbed from 1940 to 50 to 60 and peaked in 1968. And as we began a major campaign towards uh, changing the rich American diet, and as the cholesterol levels came down, as people began to exercise, as uh, the meat consumption went down, you see a 25 to 30 percent drop in the death rate from heart disease. The figures are in. It's very clear that our lifestyle determines the mortality of a society and the lifespan of a society. I want to take you to perhaps one or two more studies. And I want to take you 
to Finland. The county of eastern Finland, called Karelia, has a population of 180,000 people. It is known as the county of beautiful widows. Widows that are oftentimes under the age of 35 years. And behind this appealing slogan hides the grim fact that this gorgeous, lake splattered area holds the world's record for heart disease mortality. In some schools, as, as many as one-third of the children have no fathers still alive. Two-thirds of the deaths are due to heart attacks and strokes. Fifty percent of adult males experience angina chest pains before they even reach 30, 45 years of age. Think of it. To have angina pain, to have heart disease, to have atherosclerosis vessels before even reaching 45 years of age. And they say when a man meets another man on the street and they're under 40 years of age and they ask the question, do you have angina? The answer is usually, if they are lucky, not yet. Because it's expected that by the time you are 40, 45, 50 years, that you develop angina, an inevitable, it seems, symptom of heart disease. And women are not safe either. Women have three times more heart disease than the world's average. What's wrong in Karelia? Are these people living too close to the Russian bear? Is the stress giving them heart disease? Folks, there is not very much stress because these are not urban centers. These are little villages where people live peacefully. But something is wrong in Karelia. What is it? Is it a lack of exercise? No, because most people in Karelia are farmers and lumberjacks. And they don't have all the power tools that we have. They get plenty of exercise. Exercise does not prevent heart disease. If you follow a lethal diet, the best exercise program in the world is not going to prevent it. Arthur Rash, 35 years of age, heart attack, Wimbledon champion. So it's not a matter of stress. It's not a matter of exercise or lack of it. Are these people overweight? Not really. They're not that overweight. So it's not that either. What is wrong in Karelia? The people there, if they're not lumberjacks, they're farmers, dairy farmers. And you're right. These people are living on a very high-fat diet. And the Karelian people are making ample use of the products they produce especially dairy products. Let me give you a little idea what a breakfast is like. Breakfast consists of three glasses of fat-rich milk, several slices of thickly buttered bread, usually about an eighth to a quarter of an inch thick, that is the butter on it. Usually they have two eggs and sausage and a mug of coffee with heavy cream. It's really heavy cream with coffee. Other meals consist mostly of beef, pork, and pastries, and vegetables and fruits rarely found on the dinner table. And of course, what would you expect the average cholesterol levels are? The 250, 260, 270, 280. But the people of Karelia only recently made aware of their dubious distinction of being the number one in heart disease in the world begin to do something about it. Many women approached the government and said, we still have a husband, but we don't want to lose him. Can't you help us? Is there something wrong with our diet? What can we do? And so Dr. Puska was sent to this part of Finland and established an educational program. Laws were passed forbidding smoke in public places. The dairy industry joined the effort and marketed now skim milk. 
People were encouraged to grow and eat fresh vegetables and to dramatically cut back on butter and all animal products. There was a lot of co cooperation from the local industry, food providers, except for one large sauces factory. The owner was not prepared to take his sausage skins and stuff them with mushrooms and grains to produce a new sausage. He was holding out with his high fat, high meat product until he suffered a heart attack, became a believer, and now produced a new low fat vegetarian sausage. A housewife organization called the Marthas was set up in every village to organize the meetings. They would be sent to a special training program and then they would come back to the different villages and they would train the women in that particular village. They were very successful except that the medical establishment of Karelia became rather uneasy about this consumerism movement and they said we all know as doctors that heart disease has nothing to do with diet it has nothing to do with lifestyle it's a genetic problem we have problems here because it's in our genes but somehow the Marthas and the research group won out and I want to tell you what the results have been within six years Six years after the initiation of this major health promotion program, the annual mortality rate among middle-aged men dropped 15%. The heart attack rate dropped 15% as well, and strokes have decreased by 30%. These successes, lots of people saved, these successes were accomplished for less than $1.50 per person per year. Does behavioral change pay? Does lifestyle medicine pay? Does your personal investment in your health pay dividends? Let me just go one step further and take you to animal studies. We have known for 20, 30 years that you can kill animals. The only thing you have to do with monkeys is you take away their natural diet and you give them a typical hospital diet. After four years, the monkeys will have died of heart attacks. I tell my patients, don't stay in a hospital more than four years. You can take the 25 favorite American foods, you feed it to monkeys, and within two and a half years, these monkeys will have died. But you can do something else. After you have fed these monkeys these diets, and you have produced the 70, 80, 90% narrowing, you can then take these monkeys before they die, like humans die from heart disease, and now you give them a simple diet. A diet of grains and vegetables, and you might even give them some bananas. These monkeys now, on their more natural diet, when you examine the arteries down the line, you find that after two, three, four years, instead of being 90% closed, that is their corner arteries, they're now open again. Heart disease is reversible in monkeys. Heart disease is reversible in doves. Heart disease is reversible in pigs. Heart disease is reversible in cockerels, in roosters. We have done this. We can produce heart disease depending on the kind of diet that we feed. If there's a lot of egg yolk involved, a lot of cholesterol, and a lot of oil such as corn oil or whatever you want to use, you can always produce in most species heart disease. And you can also reverse it. Question. Does it work for humans? Here you see the world authority, Dr. Robert Whistler, University of Chicago, he said, the process of atherosclerosis is almost completely preventable and is substantially reversible. But if you want to produce a regression, a reversal of these plaques, you need to get the cholesterol levels in your blood below 160 
and that begins to take place when you leave out the animal products, the cholesterol and the fat. Turning the patient's course of artery disease around only begins, Dr. Connor says, when the blood cholesterol level goes below 160 points, and this only occurs if you leave out animal products and fats. Here's some data from University of Southern California showing that those patients who lowered their cholesterol by 21% had regression of certain atherosclerotic plaques in certain arteries. While those who only reduced their cholesterol by 6% had a progression of the disease. And here's the most exciting story for the evening. For my health program, I think it should fill you with great promise. And instead of being perhaps somewhat discouraged, knowing that maybe you already have a significant narrowing of some of your arteries, listen carefully. It is never too late to make changes because Dr. Dean Ornish published the results of an unusual experiment in October of 1989, which is a watershed mark study in the annals of modern medicine. Listen carefully. In the last two minutes, I want you to be really paying close attention. Dr. Ornish took 50 heart disease patients, angina, narrowed arteries, subject to bypass surgery. He took 50 patients and half of the patients he put on the prudent American Heart Association diet. That's a diet that allows you to go from 40% fat down to 30% fat, that allows you to go from 500 milligrams of cholesterol down to 300 milligrams of cholesterol, it's a diet that is making some changes, but they're rather modest. He also told these people, aside from using the American Heart Association prudent diet that is advocated by most clinicians, he said, I want you to lose weight and to stop smoking and to get an exercise program. What about the other 25? He took the other 25 people and he said, I want you to go on a natural food diet where the fat content is not 40% or 30% as you have on the American Heart Association, but only 10%, virtually no added fat, very little added fat. It was a vegetarian diet, no animal products, except for some skim milk. He also told these people to lose weight, to stop smoking, to exercise every day, and he gave them one hour of meditation in addition to that. Now these people all had very sophisticated analytical studies done to measure the amount of arterial closure or narrowing. As a matter of fact, per person, the evaluation cost was $80,000. This is the most sophisticated, the most avant-garde evaluation procedure ever used in America. And then they checked them out again after one year. The 25 patients, heart disease patients, that followed the prudent American diet and those that followed a very low-fat vegetarian diet plus meditation. The cholesterol on the American Heart Association day, diet was virtually unchanged. It was still 220, 230 in that neighborhood. While the cholesterol levels in the more progressive diet had dropped down to 140, 135 points. Do you remember the research community said that you need to get your cholesterol down to 170, 160 to produce regression, reversal of disease. Their cholesterol levels really dropped down dramatically. And then, when the data came in, what happened to their coronary arteries, they found that the arterial diameter that had been narrowed very dramatically 
had opened up by 10%. The disease had actually regressed. It had begun to reverse itself. And what about the group here? The American Heart Association died. They found that the disease had progressed by another 8%. And Dr. Dean Ornish said at a recent National American Heart Association meeting, he said, ladies and gentlemen, I wonder how prudent the American Heart Association prudent diet really is because it seems to promote heart disease rather than turn it around. You cannot temporize with heart disease. You have to make a real commitment. You got to take God's wonders, his creation. You need to go and look at the kind of foods that he has provided. Somebody said to me last night, well, you mentioned to us to cut back on meat and to cut back on cholesterol and to cut back on sugar and to cut back on fats and to cut back on salt. Is there anything left to eat? Folks, I want you to take a look. There's lots and lots of foods. If you become less dependent on meat as a centerpiece of your diet, you'd be surprised that you have much more variety. You can eat more. You have more color on your plate. And I promise you, you can save 40% on your dollar bill. You can save 40% on your food bill. You know what you do with that money? You can buy exotic foods like papayas and mangoes. You can eat anything you want, but buy it as simple foods. Enjoy it without feeling guilty, and you have money left over to buy yourself a new wardrobe for a new body. Thank you. Friend, that health that you long to have is within your grasp. Dr. Hans Deal has prepared for you the book that you've been looking for. It's entitled, To Your Health. This book will show you how to eat more and lose weight naturally and permanently. You'll learn to eat better and cut your food budget in half. And best of all, you'll learn how to reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer by 80%. Please call now and ask for information on how you can receive Dr. Deal's book, To Your Health. Lifestyle Medicine Institute is dedicated to helping people live healthier lives and to restore health. The Institute offers best-selling books, videos, audio cassettes, and seminars. The popular Lifeline bi-monthly newsletter keeps you up to date on the latest health information. For more information, call 909-825-1888. From the Tacoma Dome in beautiful Washington State, the Quiet Hour and Lifestyle Medicine Institute are proud to present Dr. Hans Deal in New Beginnings. I want to talk to you tonight in a summarization form of how the American diet cannot only promote disease, but how a change, a simplification in the American diet can prevent and regress or reverse diseases. 
I want to talk to you about the envy of the world, namely the rich American diet. A diet that is rich in meat, eggs, dairy products, sweets, ice cream, pastries, and fried foods, which is almost universally envied around the world. <clears throat> this is the very kind of diet that we think is desirable for children to go strong and big on, and big they grow. Our present American diet, however, is at great variance with the history of human eating. For instance, the Babylonians, the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and Romans built their culture on a staple of wheat. The Oriental cultures, as you know, are built on the staple of rice. And the civilizations of the Aztecs and Mayas were built on the staples of corn and beans. These great cultures developed with their people consuming large amounts of grains and legumes, vegetables and fruits. You see, in these cultures, in these civilizations, meat and animal products were basically reserved for special feast days, or it was used as a condiment, as a seasoning. At the same time, sugar, fat, and salt, in the absence of food technology, was very scarce in those societies. It is only recently, even in our culture, that we can now afford a diet that is very rich in meat, animal products, and refined, engineered foods. And today, we face the situation that with the economic prosperity of the last 50 years and with the dubious blessings of food technology, we can almost turn every day into a feast day. Inexpensive starchy foods such as whole wheat bread, potatoes, beans, no longer serve as the stuff of life for the masses. Instead, most grain today is set aside as fodder to fatten animals for the human larder. Thus, animal products such as meat, poultry, eggs, and dairy products, and fats consumed as spreads, cooking oils, and salad dressings have actually become the new staples for the masses. And today, most people, not just the elite, not just the rich, in affluent society, live off the fat of the land, and by historic standards, the dietary shift is absolutely staggering. We have never seen anything like it where almost 50% of the calories that we consume in America will come from fats. And another 20 to 24% will come from sugar. Our diet has dramatically changed over the last 100 years. And wherever people eat this kind of a diet, you will always see the emergence of so-called Western diseases, namely high rates of heart disease, stroke, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, diabetes. It is estimated that the majority of disability in the United States relates to a diet that is too rich. And while we think we have found 
the good life, we're beginning to realize there's a kicker to it. The good life is turning out to be actually eroding our health. contributing to disease and give, giving us anything but the good life. And for that reason, we appeal to you not to aim for the good life, but to aim for the best life. And the best life is a simplified life, a lifestyle that was characterized by Paul Dudley White, the great cardiologist that was the personal physician of President Eisenhower. He said, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to live with all your heart, listen carefully, he said, number one, eat the diet of a poor nation. Number two, he said, burn holes into the soles of your shoes and not holes into the tires of your cars. Exercise every day. I might want to add, stay away from harmful substances such as smoking and tobacco, uh, alcohol. And number four, find a purpose in life that goes beyond the grave. A purpose that unifies your life, gives it meaning, and ultimately basks in the privilege of being of service to someone else. But you see, the good life is not good enough. We want the very best life, and the best life is a simplified life, a life that has a simpler diet attached to it. I think the evidence is mounting. We have libraries filled with the scientific evidence that very clearly pinpoints and incriminates the rich American diet, or if you want me to say the rich Western diet, as the primary, essential, and necessary cause of the current epidemic of atherosclerotic diseases and a majority of cancers. Let's take a look at some of our slides. If we can have the lights off, please. <clears throat> We discovered in the last few meetings that cardiovascular disease is responsible for almost every second death in North America, a disease that is virtually unheard of in 70, 80 percent of the world's population. We also learned that every fourth person in North America is dying from cancer, diseases, again, that are unheard of in most societies and we begin to look at the underlying disease process that clinically expresses itself as heart disease and as strokes and so on we looked at atherosclerosis a gradual filling in of the arteries in our system so that not enough blood and oxygen can be delivered to target organs and so then we begin to suffer from degenerative diseases, diseases that come on very gradually. Diseases that may take 20, 30, 40 years to develop, but they can take your life in minutes. And then we discussed with you the risk factor concept, where we can pinpoint certain factors that are placing you at a higher risk for developing heart disease, stroke, and cancers. We call these factors, these red flags, these determinants of atherosclerotic-related diseases, risk factors. We talked about the eminent risk factor of cholesterol, the kingpin in the arch predisposing us to heart disease stroke and probably cancers of certain kinds. We learned that you can take high cholesterol levels that is above 180 out of the arch and even if you do everything wrong you will not be able to develop atherosclerosis in animals. 
So an elevated cholesterol is very powerfully predictive of heart disease. We also talked about high blood pressure, which can be modified by dietary means. We talked about blood fats, the triglycerides. We also talked about diabetes, and we talked about obesity. And I'm sure you will not argue with me too much that diabetes and especially obesity may have something in common with eating, wouldn't you? And so the evidence is very overwhelming that these modern killer diseases such as heart disease, stroke, and certain adult cancers, as well as diabetes, are largely the result of our lifestyle, especially the way we eat. We can largely prevent and even reverse many of these diseases. We can stop our slide towards degenerative diseases and death. The question to be asked tonight is not why shouldn't we change? The question should be why should we change? We should change because we have learned from large studies around the world that when people do change, they have less problems from elevated cholesterol levels. Their triglyceride levels will come down. We can demonstrate that insulin injections are no longer necessary in many type 2 diabetics if they just make some change in their lifestyle. We also have discussed that 50 to 85% of all the patients using medication to control blood pressure, antihypertensive drugs can be off these medications oftentimes in less than four weeks by making some significant dietary changes, simplifying the diet. And of course, we have discussed that a simplification of our diet in America would greatly ease the burden of weight management. We talk to you about how to eat more and weigh less of the right foods. And I think this kind of a new diet, a simplified diet, would also become good medicine for ailing food budgets. Here you see the change in the American diet. We have more than doubled the increase of sugars. We have almost doubled the intake of fats. We have slightly increased our intake of protein, particularly animal protein. And these increases have all been at the expense of the complex carbohydrate foods, the grains and the potatoes and the vegetables the pastas, the grains in particular. And Dr. Mark Hegstead, a well-recognized former professor at Harvard University, said it very well. He said, Americans eat too much food, too much fat, cholesterol, salt, and sugar. They should cut their consumption of these and increase the intake of fruits, vegetables, and especially whole grains. And furthermore, before the Senate, he said, the diet of the American people is becoming increasingly rich in meat and other sources of fat, particularly saturated fat and cholesterol. And this diet, he said, which affluent people generally consume everywhere, is associated and linked with similar disease patterns, high rates of heart disease, certain types of cancer, diabetes, obesity are major killers. And a year and a half ago, the Surgeon General's report on nutrition health came out. This is just a summarization. The report is over 750 pages documenting the close relationship between how people eat and certain diseases. And of course, the summarization statement is right there. Where the Surgeon General says, one personal choice seems to influence long-term health prospect more than any other what we eat. And so what we like to recommend to you 
is that we seriously look at some lifestyle changes. What is very intriguing to me is that there is a unitary dietary principle in dealing with Western killer diseases. There is not one diet to take care of diabetes and another diet to take care of hypertension and yet another diet for taking care of heart disease or stroke. There is one basic diet that we begin to discover that has all the markings of reducing all of these problems. And such a diet is a breaking with the American diet, which is high in fats and high in sugars. It is a breaking with the American diet that is high in animal products. A diet that we be, would better be more planned food centered. It is breaking with the American diet that is too rich in manufactured foods. Think of it. You go into a supermarket and 30,000 foods scream at you. I mean, they're just like magnets. They just bounce right out of the shelves into your shopping cart. And you wonder how you got them in there when the cashier rings up the bill. 30,000 foods, slickly packaged, cleverly marketed, placed just at the right level where you can see them. Think of it. Our diet is no longer what it used to be. Food technology has given us the tools to create a synthetic, artificial, engineered diet that has very little in common with food. Let me give you some examples that we discussed before. You take a very well-constructed, well-packaged potato. 80 calories. But instead of eating the potato, many of us, and especially the young ones, are settling more and more for refined potato products such as potato chips. And we try to help you to understand that you go from 80 calories up to 1,000 plus calories in that these chips are no longer potatoes, but the potato has become a delivery system of fat, enriched with salt, which again pushes our risk for high blood pressure considerably up. And at the same time, instead of spending 15 cents for a large potato, we are now willing to spend $1.69 for an engineered product. Or you can take corn. Do you realize that it takes 14 years of corn? To develop one tablespoon of corn oil. And how easy it is to take that corn, especially when it comes in the form of mayonnaise. We don't even realize it's there. We could never overeat if it wouldn't have food technology to extract the oil, the fat from the ears of corn. Because how many of you could eat 14 ears of corn in one session? I want to try it? Or you can take the aspect of an apple. We sometimes refine food ourselves. It doesn't have to always be the food technologist we sometimes become involved too. You may take an apple of 80 calories and you make it into an apple pie and one slice, especially a la mode, now has 600 calories. And you say, well, can't we have a piece of apple pie once in a while? Of course. Next time you have one, really relish it. Enjoy it to the very utmost. You might want to leave the ice cream off and the cheese and the whipped cream but enjoy that apple pie because you know you're not going to have another one for four weeks. So we are talking about food technology on one hand that has prepared taste 
sensation that makes it very difficult for some of us to resist this kind of a food, especially when it's sold as convenience foods. On the other hand, you have a diet that is more and more animal product oriented. The meats, the sausages, the dairy products, the cheeses, are very high in fat and usually high in salt. And again, when you have these two combinations, an engineered refined diet and an animal product centered diet on the other hand, when you combine, combine these two, you will always have the basis for the development of Western killer diseases in any given society. Fortunately, we can change our diet, can't we? And what I'd like to recommend to you is this. If you have been living on the American diet, which is the outer red ring, where you eat anything that is edible, anything that crawls, moves, or runs, we eat it. You want to get away from this diet, which is very high in fat and sugar and uh, salt and grease and so on, and you want to move away from this kind of a typical American diet and perhaps move towards the second circle here, which we sometimes call the United States Dietary Goals, where you really cut back on your cholesterol intake and you reduce your fat level and you are cutting back on high fat, high sugary foods. Some of you might want to move one step closer towards an ideal diet and you might want to consider this inner ring here which allows your cholesterol up to 100 milligrams. Most of us consume 600 to 700. Remember, an egg yolk alone has 225 milligrams of cholesterol. That is one egg. And if you have three for an omelet, God help us. But you see, we like to recommend that you keep your cholesterol level below 100 milligrams and so we recommend a diet that would have a fat content not of 45% or 30% as the American Heart Association recommends as a first step towards an improvement, but we think it is safer to move towards a diet that is more like 20% fat or maybe 15% fat, where you try to stay away not only from the refined fats like the salad oils and the butters and the margins, but you also become very cognizant that most fat in the diet is very well hidden. Many people don't know that a sirloin steak is 75 to 80% fat. Many people don't know that uh, a cheeseburger, one of those triple whammies, is 60% fat. Many people don't know that cream cheese is 90% fat. And some of you, if you have serious heart disease, you might even want to go one step further where you aim for the center, the bullseye, and you now adopt a diet free of meat, a diet that is also very, very low in fat and sugar, where you leave out refined foods. And so I want to discuss with you tonight briefly as a summary lecture, the 10 dietary guidelines. What you want to do is become more aware that we need to cut back on our visible fats and oils, to cut back on our sugars, to severely limit our dietary cholesterol, to severely limit our salt intake, and to avoid the use of alcohol, teas, and caffeinated drinks. And then sometimes you wonder, is there anything left to eat? I have some good news for you tonight. Yes, there is. You can eat all you want. Basically, if you choose these foods simply prepared, without all the dressings, without all the grease and oil, you can eat all the whole grain products, freely used tubers, the potatoes and legumes, Freely use fresh fruits and vegetables. These are really convenience foods. There's nothing you have to do. Just wash it 
or in the case of bananas, peel it and enjoy. And then number nine, drink plenty of water. And the last one, always have a good breakfast. You would never go on a trip with an empty tank in your car. But how many Americans are stepping out of their home with an empty tank every morning wondering why they have to have the nibblings, why they cannot lose weight, why their blood sugar levels are not stabilized, why they're edgy. A good breakfast that breaks the fast of the night should become a good habit of most of us. Now let's take a little closer look at these 10 guidelines. Somebody has called them the dietary decalogue. Avoid, number one, avoid all visible fats and oils. Avoid the fatty meals and meats. Avoid the cooking and salad oils as much as you can. Try to be careful with oily dressings and shortening. And if you use some margarine and nuts, only use them sparingly. As you know, a couple handful of nuts is about 1,300 calories or one-third of a pound of fat. And so you want to eat nuts very sparingly. Then also try to avoid frying and uh, whenever you can, saute with water. We can learn a lot from our Oriental friends in this particular area. Number two. Try to cut back on sugars, particularly the sugar in syrups, in pies, and cakes, and pastry, candy, cookies, soft drinks, all the things that we enjoy and associate with a good life, don't we? But they're really not in our best interest. Try to use these sugary foods very sparingly. Try to cut back as much as you can. And if you have a sweet tooth, let me make a recommendation. There is an answer for a sweet tooth. See your dentist. <clears throat> Number three, try to really cut back on your cholesterol. It is not good enough to just move towards the American Heart Association diet. We probably have to go beyond. We need to recognize that cholesterol is only found in animal products. And so cholesterol is very richly found in egg yolks and of course, the red meats. But remember that chicken has just as much cholesterol as you find in beef. Try to get away from the cheeses, which again are carrying a good slug of cholesterol, plus they're very high in fat and salt. And if you use some fish and fowl, use it sparingly. Some people think it might even be better not to use any fish and any fowl because there are some other problems associated with that. Because after all, we in America consume probably 200 to 300 percent more protein than we should have, and that then becomes a problem in terms of overloading the kidneys and leading to kidney disease as one of the diseases in American society. So if you want to use fish and fowl at all, use it sparingly. Number four, try to cut back on your salt. Remember that 60 to 70 percent of all the salt we eat is in commercially prepared products. So you want to learn to read labels. And of course, you want to leave the salt shaker alone, don't you? There's no need for most of us to use any salt shaker. Remember that dill pickles are very high in salt. Some of these commercial prepared foods, such as fast foods, are salt mines. You want to go very easy on these kind of foods. Pretzels, nuts, chips, they're all loaded with salt. Try to cut back on these kind of foods. And again, as I said to you earlier, try to get away from alcohol and caffeinated drinks. And then, what then shall we eat? Let's take a look at this. You have principle number six, eat freely whole grain products. Brown rice is just nice. Pasta is perfect. Enjoy the different uh, pastas that are available the spaghettis, the fettuccinis. Just be careful with the cheese and the toppings. And enjoy real bread. And always have, if you can, a three or five or seven or nine grain cereal. 
We just did a major citywide educational program in Kelowna, British Columbia, and I received last night the report that the seven grain cereal that is used for breakfast dishes in a crock pot, you just put it in at night, you go to bed, turn it on low heat. When you wake up, after you've done your morning exercises, you come back and there's a piping hot breakfast waiting for you. The health food stores in Kelowna have advised me that from the time that I came to Kelowna until two months later, the consumption of seven grain cereal jumped 10 times. And the merchants just loved it. So you want to eat more of the whole grain products. If you don't like a hot cereal, may I recommend shredded wheat as a very good alternative. Here you see the abundance of grains that we have. I recommend whole wheat buns. I recommend oats for breakfast. I recommend to eat more of the unrefined grains. And if you cannot find a good bread, I recommend that you husbands be good to your wives and buy them a beautiful Bosch machine so that your wives can make good, wholesome bread in less than one hour from the moment you grind it to the time it comes out of the oven. What do you think, ladies? Is that a good idea? All right. Principle number seven, eat more tubers and legumes. By tubers, of course, we mean different kinds of potatoes. Eat more of the rooty, roots type uh, vegetables. Sweet potatoes are just lovely. Yams, enjoy them, not just at Thanksgiving time, but you want to use them more often. There's a variety of squash. They tell me there are some 20 different kinds of squash. And when it comes to beans, they tell me there are 40 some kinds of beans. Why don't you try some, especially as you take advantage of your crock pot, which helps you to save so much time. Different kinds of potatoes, different colors, different textures in the area of lentils and beans. And they are all there, rich in nutrition, rich in fiber, but low in calories by and large. You can even sprout some of these seeds and you have your own nutrition factory. No longer will you need vitamin supplements if you ever needed them. You can have your own vitamin and mineral production unit right in your home for a fraction of the cost that you pay for it usually. And then number eight, fresh fruits and of course vegetables. Freely eat fresh fruits that is in season you save money and you probably have a better quality. But try to avoid the fruit juices because it's a concentration of sugar, even though it's natural sugar. Try to stay away from the heavy syrupy uh, type of canned fruits. Use light syrup if you want to buy it in a can. And enjoy the salads and enjoy the vegetables. Look at the abundance of God's convenience foods. They're all there in different colors, in different textures. Just slice your orange next time a little differently and always remember to garnish it and you'll be amazed how the mouth begins to water. Look at the abundance of fruits and vegetables available to us here in North America. What a designer God. Do you see? No food comes even close to it. And enjoy the tomatoes. Enjoy the green peppers and the cucumbers. And look again at the variety of texture, all rich in minerals and vitamins and fiber. We should begin to move more towards a Japanese diet the way it used to be. We should orientalize our diet more, especially if we don't use fat, but we just saute it with water. I wish we could turn all the lights off for just one minute and just enjoy the beauty of God's design 
and you never have to worry about calories just absolutely good that's the dessert I like to recommend when the season is here and number nine drink plenty of water we should drink at least eight or nine or ten glasses of fluid you notice I said water because sometimes people think it could be a spirit to drink no I mean water if you want to buy the water in bottles if you want to filter that's all right but most water is probably all right depending on the area and then number 10 our last principle here always eat a good breakfast in closing then I like to recommend the principles of Dr. Paul Dudley White if you want to live with all your heart if you want to die younger as late as possible and if you want to have the option again of dying of old age then I recommend to you eat a simple diet a diet that is perhaps eaten by most countries around the world where people don't have the affluence of taking food and making it into man-made foods where they don't have the money to take foods and feed it to animals and then we eat the carcass instead but let us seriously consider of simplifying our diet and to recognize the marvelous design of the master architect and number two burn holes into the soles of your shoes and not into the tires of your car exercise every day stay away from harmful substances and find a purpose that satisfies you god bless you all Friend, that health that you long to have is within your grasp. Dr. Hans Deal has prepared for you the book that you've been looking for. It's entitled, To Your Health. This book will show you how to eat more and lose weight naturally and permanently. You'll learn to eat better and cut your food budget in half. And best of all, you'll learn how to reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer by 80%. Please call now and ask for information on how you can receive Dr. Deal's book, To Your Health. Lifestyle Medicine Institute is dedicated to helping people live healthier lives and to restore health. The Institute offers best-selling books, videos, audio cassettes, and seminars. The popular Lifeline bi-monthly newsletter keeps you up to date on the latest health information. For more information, call 909-825-1888.